Hello, everyone. This is number three in my new ongoing series on YouTube dealing with Bible prophecy. The long title of the series could well be Interpretations of Biblical Prophecies Through the Ages from Ancient into Modern Times. But that's a mouthful, so I'm just calling it Bible prophecy. And I'm numbering these sequentially because I'll be uploading other things to YouTube along the way. So this is the third one. By the Bible, I mean the Hebrew Bible, which Christians call the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. So the standard Christian Bible, the Bible we think of as the Bible in our Western culture, the Gideon Bible, the one you find in the hotel rooms, no matter what religion you are. And in this video, I want us to begin to consider the book of Daniel, which is in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Most people, when they think of Bible prophecy, especially if they're coming from a Christian background, would go immediately to the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament, which is considered by everybody, I think, to be the primary prophetic text of the entire Bible. However, the book of Daniel is actually more fundamental, and it's more foundational, and it's important to begin at the beginning. And I would even argue, and I think many scholars would agree with this, that the book of Revelation is highly derivative of the book of Daniel, and it develops from the visions of the book of Daniel and repeats them. And you could even say, it is an interpretation in the later Greco-Roman period with the early Christians and ancient Jews of the late Second Temple period as to what the book of Daniel is really all about. So it makes sense to start with Daniel. So let me explain something about Daniel as I begin. Uh, I've got a standard Christian Bible here, Old and New Testament. And if you open it up and go to the book of Daniel, it's in the major prophets. It's in the section called the prophets by Christians. So you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So it's right there with all the big ones. And then you have the 12 so-called minor prophets, which really just means they're shorter. So it is one of the four major prophets in the Christian Bible. However, if you take a Jewish Bible, this is an English translation of the Hebrew Bible. It's in the back. It's not with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Some of you might know that, but many people don't realize that. I opened it up here. You can see where it is in the back of the book. And it's in a section of the Hebrew Bible called the Writings. And this final section called the Writings, the Ketuvim of the Hebrew Bible, has books like Job, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and so forth, as well as uh, the book of Daniel. So what does that mean? It means the same thing that it means for the book of Revelation to be at the end of the New Testament. A lot of people would think, well, it definitely belongs at the end because it's kind of the final book to summarize everything, and it ends with Jesus saying, surely I come quickly. So it is an appropriate ending. And it does have a saying at the end about don't add to or take from this book. So that kind of seals off the New Testament. But the reason it's in the back, really, historically speaking, is because it wasn't accepted by all factions and groups within the early church. In other words, it had trouble achieving canonicity, as we call it, being included in the final Christian canon in the third and fourth centuries CE as the Christian letters were put together. As you probably know, there were other writings and books that were considered by the various bishops that met to define the canon of the New Testament. And sometimes Revelation would be included and sometimes it wouldn't. And even other books, for example, the epistle or letter of Barnabas. Some had argued that that should be in the New Testament. 
But anyway, it is what it is. But I think the reason Daniel's in the back of the Hebrew Bible is very similar. Uh, it wasn't accepted by all quarters of the Jewish worldwide community as the Hebrew Bible got more and more formulated, what should be in, what should be out. And this is a fairly late process that went on in the centuries before the time of Jesus into his own time. Remember, all the documents of the Bible, whether it's the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, were written on manuscripts and scrolls. So to assemble them together in one book would be very, very difficult. You could have two arms full of scrolls spilling over and dropping on the floor, or you could have one huge long scroll. Can you imagine if you've seen a Torah scroll, you can see the five books of Moses are manageable, but there's no way you could even lift or use a scroll that had put together all the books that are currently in the Hebrew Bible, and the same for the New Testament. And so what happens is you begin to get what's called a codex, in which you put pages together and bind them on the edge. And that happened, we think, first with the New Testament. So back to the book of Daniel. I've got some slides, and I think that's the best way to get into this. So let me share my screen. So I'm calling this part one because we've got to do a few uh, segments on Daniel. The Mysterious Dreams and Visions of Daniel. Here's this wonderful painting or drawing by Blake. I just love it. That represents the four beasts of the book of Daniel in chapter seven, which we'll get to. So let's go ahead. The visionary materials in Daniel are chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, and then 11 and 12. 11 and 12 are one vision. So we've got five visions to cover. Today I want to just do 2 and 7, and then I will turn to 8 and 9, and then 11 and 12. These will all be separate segments because I want us to really dive into them. I mean, these are short videos, relatively speaking. So I don't know if you call it dive into them, but I don't want to give a survey of all five in one segment that would really not be adequate. Now, these visionary materials, dreams and visions, they really stand out as unique compared to other materials in the Hebrew Bible. There are little segments in the Hebrew Bible. For example, Isaiah 2, first four verses that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord will be established and all the nations will flow to it. And many people will say of the nations, come, let's go up to the house of the Lord and learn the ways of God and he will teach us the Torah and so forth. And then it goes on to say, nations will not lift up sword against nations, neither will they learn war anymore. So that's a very idealistic and hopeful vision of the future, but it's just a little snippet of Isaiah. Isaiah 11 is an entire chapter, and I would call it the Messianic chapter, the Davidic Messiah chapter, because the entire chapter introduces you to the one people call the Messiah, the son of David, that Christians believe Jesus fulfilled, and it tells you all the things that he's supposed to do when he comes. Isaiah 24 through about 28, you've got several chapters. Scholars call it the Isaiah Apocalypse. In the New Testament, you've got chapters like Mark 13, sometimes called the Little Apocalypse of Jesus, in which Jesus is asked, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And that's actually got three versions to it because Matthew gives a version based on Mark and then Luke gives an edited version, even taking into consideration what Matthew wrote. I've got videos up on that that I've covered and I covered it in my Mark course, if any of you were in that course that was online and still available, you can look for it. I'll put it in the description in case any of you are interested. So, and then you've got writings of Paul, and Paul has several prophetic sections, 
one of which is very much based on the book of Daniel. That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's basically an interpretation of Daniel, uh, the end of Daniel 11 and 12. So, and the book of Revelation, of course, we can't leave that out. So Daniel is the book to begin with as we look at the Hebrew Bible, putting it all together. Now, I would also say that these visions of Daniel, as I mentioned, are full of symbols, and there are many, many interpretations through the ages. But what makes them so appealing is they begin to talk about a sequence of events and even a chronology, as some people have understood it, that could lead you toward a kind of countdown of the end, like a prophetic clock ticking getting near midnight. And Daniel is really the only text in the Hebrew Bible that has that kind of thing. And the book of Revelation repeats some of that and even uses some of the same numbers, but in different ways. So let's start with Daniel 2 and get into it here. I call this uh, slideshow Visions and Dreams of Daniel, but this is actually a dream of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, but Daniel is able to interpret it by, I think, what you would call a vision or a dream. He's given the interpretation according to the story. So the story is basically that King Nebuchadnezzar, the conqueror of Jerusalem, had a vision. This goes back to the 6th century BC, and Daniel is a captive, one of the Jewish captives that the Babylonians took to the capital, Babylon. And he's being educated in all the Babylonian ways with three of his friends, these young Jewish captives. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he's troubled by it and what it means. And so he asks his seers and wise men, I had a dream, he says, and it's really bothering me, and I want to know the interpretation. And they all raise their hand and say, yeah, we can tell you, because that's what they do. They're paid to do this. And he says, wait, wait, wait. Uh, tell me the dream and the interpretation. And they're like, what? Well, we can't tell you the dream. You had the dream. You have to tell us the dream, and then we'll interpret it for you. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no, uh, you know, he wants to check out their ability. Anybody could make up an interpretation, but could you tell me the dream? And then I could trust your interpretation. And so they declare nobody could do that. It does not exist anywhere, no matter who you call. And then Daniel is suggested or comes forth and he says, uh, I can't do it. But there is a God in heaven that I serve, and the God I serve, the Hebrew God, he can tell you not only the dream, but the interpretation, and he can reveal it through me. And that's what happens. So here's the dream as Daniel recounts it, and it is in the story correct. He gets it right. You saw, O king, behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So you've got this picture of this image. I'll show you an illustration in a minute of how you might imagine it. And it's got these successive qualities of metal that we know from other texts in the ancient world where you start with the gold and then go to the silver, then the bronze, and then the iron, and finally the clay. The clay, though, I think is unique to Daniel. So uh, let's go on. As you looked, so he's seeing the vision in his dream, a stone was cut out by no human hand and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces. You see it all tumbling down and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. 
but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. So what does that mean? So we don't have to guess. Here's a illustration of it. You can see the image with its different parts and then the feet of clay. That's an expression now in our culture. Uh, when we say somebody has feet of clay, it means that they're very vulnerable, ready to maybe topple over. And here you got the stone cut out of nowhere without hand. So it wasn't any human thing. It's God acting apparently and hits the stone on the feet and it all comes tumbling down and the wind comes and blows it away like chaff. So here's the interpretation. Daniel says, that was the dream. This was the dream. And now we'll tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he's given wherever they dwell, the sons of men, the beast of the field, and the birds of the air, making you rule over them. You are the head of gold. So Babylon or Nebuchadnezzar. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron, which crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom with some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mix with miry clay, they'll mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, even though you've got an interpretation, only the first is really named or implied, and that is you, the Babylonian king, are the first king or the first kingdom. And then there are going to be a succession of three more kingdoms coming, ruling the world, the then known world. We're talking about the ancient Near East primarily. So you can see right there that this chapter is going to open itself to people saying, well, first there was Babylon, and then what came next? And trying to trace it down, because they're all interested in this fourth kingdom, because it's so different, and it shatters and crushes all the others, and totally takes everything over. And the people in charge of that kingdom try to mix people in marriage and create this great ecumenical kingdom. But they are sequential in Daniel's interpretation. And so you don't just jump around and say, well, there was this kingdom and that kingdom and put them all out of order or anything like that. And also, since this seems to be a time much beyond the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and yet it looks like it's kind of the end of the age, are you going to have to stretch out these four kingdoms to fit the end of the age? Because that's what's going to happen if it doesn't take place in the ancient world. Believers in this prophecy are not going to be satisfied with a fourth kingdom that only lasts a limited time. And then you have lots of time going after that. I guess you could say, well, Maybe the fourth kingdom lasts for a while, and then the stone comes later. But it says, as you looked and saw the vision of the four kingdoms, the stone comes. So it seems like they have to be in existence. So the standard interpretation of historians is very simple. Don't worry about these over here. These are the four beasts that parallel the four kinds of metal. And we'll get to that. That's in chapter 7. But I like this uh, illustration. So what most scholars say is that Nebuchadnezzar's the first. After him, there's a silver kingdom that's inferior, and that would be Persia, King Cyrus and Medo-Persia. And then there will be a third kingdom, Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedonia. And then a fourth kingdom, 
Antiochus IV, the Seleucid kingdom, one of the successors. When Alexander died, his vast kingdom was divided into four parts. But it's the Seleucids that primarily operate in the Holy Land. So now you're focusing in on the Holy Land. And if you remember the name Antiochus IV, he dates to the second century BC. So you're moving on down close to the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Jesus of Nazareth. So you can see how people would be very interested in trying to interpret this, because it does say in the days of these kings, God will set up a kingdom. So it's as if this kingdom is swallowed by this kingdom, which is swallowed by this kingdom, and then finally a fourth kingdom. Now, you might know Antiochus IV by the name Antiochus Epiphanes, and he is the king in the books of Maccabees. If you've heard of the Maccabees or Hanukkah, one of the Jewish festivals that was established after biblical times, he's the great persecutor who tried to stamp out Judaism. And he, according to the story, would execute people who would refuse to reject the Jewish God, Yahweh or Jehovah, and worship all the Greek gods which he served. And there was a persecution that broke out, described in the book of Maccabees, but the Jews resisted and were able to overthrow him. And so that would be seen, if you followed this view, as the final fourth kingdom being overthrown and then God's kingdom being set up. But if you take that interpretation, it's really hard to say that the stone was the victory of the Maccabees over Antiochus Epiphanes because they were then conquered by the Romans in 63 BC. And so, you know, how could you fit the vision into that kind of scenario? Now we're gonna see in the later visions, there is no question that Antiochus Epiphanes is referenced as the last king. And so his, most historians would just put the book of Daniel back in that time and classify it as a prophetic book that speculates on what's going to come, and it didn't come. And most scholars would even say it was written in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes so that those who wrote it in the Maccabean period, because those who wrote it during this Maccabean period 167 following until the Maccabean victory. And they did set up an independent Jewish state, but it would be pretty far-fetched to say that that little teeny Jewish state of the Maccabees that only lasted about a hundred years, broke in pieces and destroyed all these huge world kingdoms and became a great mountain that filled the earth. It didn't. So you'd have to say Daniel is a failed prophet. However, if a prophecy is in the Bible, for many interpreters, it's never failed. It's your understanding of it that has failed. So let's go on. So let's read Daniel's interpretation. In the days of those kings, and that's referring probably to the ten toes, because it's very specific, in the days of those kings, and it is true that the Maccabees conquered the Seleucid kingdom, but it was aligned with the Ptolemies in Egypt and their ways of counting some of the rulers down to Antiochus Epiphanes and coming up with 10. But either way, that seems to be how it's interpreted. So in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. So when this kingdom comes, it's not going to be followed by any other kingdom, which really puts a stop sign on this prophecy. And that's why it's such a problem in terms of claiming that it didn't fail, because it's supposed to break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it will stand forever. Just as you saw the stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, it broke in pieces 
the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be hereafter. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So if you were living in the time of the Maccabees, as the Dead Sea Scroll community was, you're going to say that when Antiochus Epiphanes is defeated, God's kingdom is coming. And so if you listen to or watch the previous episode where I survey the ideas and prophetic visions of the Dead Sea Scroll group, and even though they're anticipating that the Romans are going to come in, because at this time the Romans are spreading through the land, and Antiochus Epiphanes is already dealing with the Romans and paying tribute to them and trying to ally himself with them, so the Dead Sea Scroll group says that the Katim, that's what they call the Romans, will be utterly defeated, as Daniel says. And, of course, they weren't. So you can go back and listen to the details on that. Now, as you go on through time then, past the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and the Romans come in, then that fourth kingdom has to change because uh, you're supposed to have the kingdom of God. And clearly Rome was not seen by these Jewish seers as the kingdom of God. So here we have 2 Esdras chapter 12, verse 10. Very important passage because 2 Esdras, sometimes called 4th Ezra, it's in the Apocrypha. My Christian Bible here uh, as many study Bibles do, includes the Apocrypha, so you can find it and read it. It's a lot like the Christian book of Revelation in that it takes the book of Daniel and goes through and gives updated interpretations with extra visions and dreams and all kinds of things that are supposed to come. And in chapter 12, verse 10, you've got this very interesting statement. He gives a vision that essentially is repeating and echoing the Daniel vision that we just read. And he says, this is the interpretation of this vision, which you've seen. The eagle, which you saw coming up from the sea is the fourth kingdom. So he's got a fourth kingdom that is an eagle, which appeared in a vision to your brother, Daniel. That's in chapter seven. But it was not explained to him as I now explain or have explained it to you. Behold, the days are coming when a kingdom shall arise on earth, and it will be more terrifying than all the kingdoms before it. So by the time Second Esdras is written, you can plainly see it's from the first century CE, and you've got the Romans coming in, and they have to adjust and say, well, you know, Daniel thought it was Antiochus Epiphanes, and others have interpreted it that way. But we now know that the fourth kingdom had to be Rome. And so what do we get? We get an adjustment. Look at this. This is interesting. This happens again and again and again. Here we have gold, Babylon, silver, Medio Persia, brass, the Greek Empire. So that would include everything down through the time of Antiochus Epiphanes until the Romans come in. But this particular chart, the reason I put it here is whoever made this chart, clearly coming from our own time, says present from 30 BC, the Roman Empire is dated as basically the reign of Augustus, down to the present. So these have to be some pretty long legs. They need to draw this in scale. This guy needs to be about 50 feet high going off the screen here because you'd have to have all of history being an extension of the Roman Empire. So you see what's happening. Every interpreter wants it to be later and later and later so that it'll fit his or her own time. So whoever did this chart, is still waiting for the feet of clay to come with these long legs. And the two legs, look look at this, are the Western division of the Roman Empire and the Eastern division. So even today, you have the Western world and the Eastern world. And so there's this attempt to make it all fit. Now, in chapter seven, you get also four kingdoms, 
defeated at the end by the kingdom of God. But it's a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then a terrible beast that you can't even describe because he's so awful. So here we go to another possibility of stretching it out that I found very interesting. I just got these off the internet by looking around. They're all over the place. So this particular interpretation, again, most likely Christian, is saying Babylon came, Medo-Persia, Greece, but Greece only went down to 168 BC. And then Rome, but Rome ended in 476, the traditional date of the fall of Rome from the Vandals and so forth. So it ended, but that was not the end of the kingdom. Now you have the divided kingdoms. So this person wants to stretch out that fourth kingdom or those legs and feet of iron all the way down to the clay to be the United Nations, the United States, which kind of dominates the Western world, different other global unions like here's Africa, and of course, the United States of Europe. So those are all these divided kingdoms that are trying to put together the world, but it's like iron and clay, it's not going to work. Uh, almost like ancient Babylon trying to build the Tower of Babel. You can see how this would appeal to people, except when you read the text, it says, and after that will be another kingdom, and it really is hard to think that all of world history since the time of Rome in the 5th century is one kingdom, when these others are so well defined. But you got to stretch those legs out some way. Now, here's chapter 7. This is a vision of Daniel by night. So it doesn't call it a dream. It's a kazan, a vision, uh, where he sees it prophetically. And behold, he saw the four winds of heaven stirring up a sea. So he's probably seeing the Mediterranean Sea. And he's thinking that there's a storm going. And then these four beasts come out of the sea one at a time, and they're very different. The first is like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand upon two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. As you're going to see, that really fits Nebuchadnezzar because he goes crazy and loses his mind. And then he stands up and becomes rational again. In some of the other stories, in the book of Daniel. And behold, another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. So that's usually seen as Persia devouring the Medes and the other countries around what we call today Iran. And after this, I looked, and behold, a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So that's all it says about the leopard, the wing leopard with four heads. Well, Greece, maybe? Alexander the Great? This is how it's usually interpreted. And four wings? Yes, four wings, because Alexander conquered the world, as we say. But when Alexander died, his kingdom was divided into these four parts. Antiochus Epiphanes was one of those. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrible and dreadful and exceedingly strong, and it had iron teeth. It devoured and broke into pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. And it was different from all the other beasts. You can't call it by any animal. And it had 10 horns. Well, 10 horns, 10 toes, interesting. And then more, I considered the horns. So if you went with the original interpretation of the successors of Alexander, and you can count 10, it's pretty easy to kind of do that in history because you have all these rulers of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Uh, among the 10, one popped up that is a little horn, and he knocks out three of them, and they're plucked up by the roots. And 
this horn has the eyes of a man and speaks great things. He's got a mouth and he's talking. He's a speaking horn. So here's an example. We've got our lion and our bear and our four-headed leopard. And here comes this 10 horn beast that we can't even describe. So as I looked, you get more. So he's looking at the fourth beast and this final little horn that pops up. Thrones were placed and one that was ancient of days took his seat, presumably God in this context. His raiment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool and his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. So it all sorts of, it, it's like a roving chariot. We call this Merchaba. It, it's very strong later in Jewish mysticism. So they're wheels. It's a kind of a portable throne. It's also described in the book of Isaiah chapter six. And a stream of fire issued and came forth from before him. And a thousand thousand served him. You do the math. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. That's Hebrew parallelism. It's a thousand thousands. It's 10,000 times 10,000s. It means a lot. And the court sat in judgment and the books were open. So this is a judgment scene, kind of the end of days. And then I saw in the night visions. So it's like a succession of visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, okay? And he came to this figure on the throne, this ancient of days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Wow. Wow. So there you have the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, don't jump to the New Testament here. Don't jump to Jesus. Let's hold it. We're looking at the vision. Guess what? There's an interpretation. So here's a representation. This is probably done by Christians. doesn't really matter. But we've got 10,000 times 10,000 of these hosts of angelic beings. Here's the heavenly court meeting. They're opening up the books of judgment, and this human figure shows up coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, the human figure doesn't belong there. He's not an angelic being. He's a human being. And the term son of man, this is actually an Aramaic. This particular chapter of Daniel is written in Aramaic, as some of the other chapters of Daniel. And it's not the typical Hebrew expression, ben adam, a son of a human, but it's actually bar enosh, which is very similar. Enosh is the word for a weakling, a human. So a weakling came up, and Ezekiel, for example, is constantly called son of man when he has these heavenly visions, meaning, hey, you human earthling, what are you doing up here? Uh, it, it's this idea that someone appears before God who doesn't belong in the heavenly court. Now, immediately people say, well, this is the Messiah, but why don't we wait and see what Daniel is told? So he told me and made known to me the interpretation. Better to go by what Daniel was told maybe than some of the ideas people suggest. Very simple. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Now, that is very close to Daniel 2. Four kingdoms, four kings, and then the God of heaven, the stone, destroying all those kingdoms, setting up a kingdom that will last forever. But notice, the Son of Man is interpreted here as the saints of the Most High. It's a group that gets the rain. So as we go on, he wants to know the truth about the fourth beast and, and those ten horns and the little horn and all of that. And 
uh, you can read some of this yourself. I won't read it all aloud here on the video, but this horn comes up and remember three fall before it. It has eyes and a mouth that spoke great things which seem greater than its fellows. So according to most scholars, it's one of the successors of Alexander the Great and the rulers that he left in charge. And it's no longer his kingdom. It's a new kingdom because his kingdom is broken up. And it would be then Antiochus Epiphanes. As I look, this horn made war with the saints. So what did Antiochus Epiphanes do? He said, I'm blotting out Judaism. Burn your Torah scrolls. You can't circumcise your children. You're forbidden to follow the laws of the Torah. And you're forbidden to worship the one God of Israel. And what you are to do is now to acknowledge the gods of Greece so that Zeus would now be your god, the patron god of Antiochus Epiphanes. And anyone who won't do this will be killed. And so read the book of 1 Maccabees. It's in the Apocrypha. And even 2 Maccabees that is more colorful, probably more legendary. But 1 Maccabees... Many of us would say, you know, it, it's got a pretty solid historicity. The town where the Maccabees came from, Modine, has been excavated. Lots of verification archaeologically for the general story in the Jewish tradition. And remember, it's only 167 BCE. And then we got the Dead Sea Scrolls that are shortly after that time actually talking about these events. So the horn made war with the saints and prevailed until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints received the kingdom. So this final horn persecutes the Jewish people or the people of God called the saints here. It's not the Catholic idea of saints. It means the sanctified ones, the holy ones. It's used in the book of Daniel for the followers that stay faithful to God, even though they're threatened with death, they suffer as martyrs. So for the first time in Western history, we get the phenomena of martyrdom, people being executed because they refuse to give up their faith. And he prevails, this, this figure, this little horn, until the Ancient of Days comes. And then when the Ancient of Days comes and declares to this son of man in the dream that does appear or the vision, uh, I'm giving you the power and the glory and the kingdom so that the saints of the Most High can rule the whole world. So here's another representation. Here we've got our fourth beast. You can see his various horns, all the other beasts. And this is the one that we focus on. So here we go on. More interpretation. So there's a lot of interpretation on this fourth beast. A lot to delve into. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom. He'd already said four kingdoms, which shall be different from all the others. It will devour the whole earth and trample it down. Now, when Daniel was written, maybe that was the expectation. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. So he's kind of one of the final kings, and he will be different from the former and will put down three. And that fits Antiochus pretty well. He will speak words against the Most High. Absolutely. He's telling you you can't even worship the God of the Jews. And he'll wear out the saints, literally, that means grind them down to nothing and shall think to change the times and the Torah. So he's going to say, you can't keep the festivals. You can't keep the Torah. And they will be given into his hand for a time, two times and half a time. In prophetic language, that means a year and two years, which is three and half a year. Guess what? Antiochus Epiphanes, 167 down to 164 three and a half years. So it seems to really fit, and that's how most scholars read it. But the court shall sit in judgment. So when Antiochus was defeated, you should have had the end of the age. The court should have sat in judgment. 
God's people should have been delivered. They should have taken over and the kingdom should have manifested itself and last forever, just like in chapter two. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and their kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Well, obviously that didn't happen with the Seleucids because Antiochus Epiphanes was defeated by the Jewish people, but the Romans came in in 63 BC, 100 years later, and basically put the entire Holy Land under the rule of Herod the Great, who was declared to be the king of the Jews. So I don't think anybody is going to argue that Herod the Great was the son of man appearing in the clouds and given the kingdom of the world, because clearly we're not talking about the whole world anyway. So this vision has become problematic. If it's taken in a straightforward way, it clearly did not happen. And yet part of it happened three and a half years. That seems to fit. And forbidding the observance of the festivals and the Jewish customs and the Torah, as it says, all of that fit and wearing out the saints and so forth. So let me stop the share and let's talk about this just for a minute. We're going to go over it again in various ways as we go through Daniel. But I think you all can see the problem of interpretation here. If the prophecy is not failed, that is, if we don't have a failed prophecy, then we've got to do two things. In terms of that first vision, those legs of that fourth kingdom have to be Rome, for sure, because we're already into the Roman period. And then they have to extend all the way down to the end of the age, unless you argue, as some do, and we're going to cover all the interpretations, the so-called preterist view that the church was established during the Roman period, and it is the kingdom of God that stands forever and breaks in pieces and destroys all these kingdoms. However, I mean, Rome got stronger after the time of the establishment of the church. And even today, it's a little hard to argue that the main rule and power in world history has been the faithful saints of the Most High. Obviously, the established Catholic Church and the Eastern Church has had some political and social power, but to say that they fill the whole earth and are the kingdom of God seems to be a stretch for most people. But we'll get into that. I don't want to do the modern interpretations today. So we got that problem. If you take chapter 7 with the four beasts, that fourth beast has to just last forever and you have to stretch those horns out and finally get a final evil ruler that'll be like Antiochus, but it can't be Antiochus because he was even conquered by another kingdom of Rome. So you've almost, if you're going to stretch this out, you almost got to go to Rome. And yet if you go to Rome, Rome also falls. And then you have, what, 1500 years of history, world history, Western history, in which all kinds of things happen. And there are plenty of candidates for a final evil ruler. Take your pick. So it's really, really a difficult enterprise to work with these prophecies. So some people just throw them out uh, and say, forget it. It's too confusing. It's either crazy or it didn't happen or it's not worth thinking about. Most scholars would say, well, it was fulfilled from the standpoint of people that lived in the Maccabean period, but then what they subsequently expected to happen didn't happen, which is often, if not always the case so far with interpretations of biblical prophecy. So you see where we are. We're between the proverbial rock and the hard place. You throw it out, you historicize it and say, it did happen, but then it failed in terms of what happened after Antiochus, or you try to stretch it out in some way 
so that those legs become 1,500 to 2,000 years high, and you can get down to our own time. So I hope you have benefited from this survey. Next time, we're going to look at the next two chapters, Daniel 8 and then Daniel 9. And Daniel 9 is the one that has truly, truly caused the most calculations. And if you didn't hear my previous video, number two, go back and listen to that because I go over how the Dead Sea Scroll group interpreted Daniel 9 wrongly because it failed. And they thought Rome would be defeated and they knew Rome was coming. And many Christians read Daniel 9 and just move it up 100 years or so, and it becomes Jesus. And then some today have taken Daniel 9 and even stretched it out into the modern time, as well as Daniel 8, because it also talks about a final evil ruler. So we'll look at all those, we'll analyze them, we'll see what we can come up with as we move along through the book of Daniel. Take care, everyone. I hope you're anticipating this series as we move along. Please like it, share it, and uh, let's get this out to as many people as possible. It's really needed in our time. No matter what your views of Bible prophecy are, it doesn't hurt to take a good, hard, long look at the history and at the past, as you think you might want to plot the future, I think that makes good rational sense. Take care. Mm -hmm.